Politicians, master manipulators. This tribe is the absolute best when it comes to the Guru at the political game. The Shadow Lords work the hierarchies, they work the system. They will stab you in the back to get anything they want and they don't care who they work with if it achieves their end goals. Shadow Lords, they value brains over brawn. They are one of the few tribes within the Guru Nation that values your wits and intelligence versus sheer physical strength. They place a very high value on manipulation, cunning, and although they are not known for being the best warriors in the Guru Nation, that does not mean that they are not very capable when it comes to fisticuffs. Power is the only thing that speaks to a Shadow Lord, and however they achieve it isn't really important to the rest of the tribe. The Guru Nation might have something to say about this, but when it comes to the Shadow Lords, power is everything. When it comes to the Shadow Lords, there is zero tolerance for mercy, compassion, or weakness. It could be in a battle of wits, it could be in a physical battle, it doesn't matter, weakness is death. The Shadow Lords also have a very rocky history when it comes to one of the other tribes in the Guru Nation. We'll get into that in a little bit. The Shadow Lords will never miss an opportunity to make this tribe look as moronic as possible. So let's discuss the Shadow Lords. Now, if you want to get more World of Darkness videos, lore content, then please hit the subscribe button with the like button to let me know how you feel about the Shadow Lords. Today's video isn't actually going to have a sponsor in it, but I thought I would take this opportunity to quickly mention the Patreon that I have. If you want to support the channel, if you want to support the work that I do, please feel free to join me and the Snack Pack as we discuss World of Darkness, Starfinder, Pathfinder, your favorite role-playing games. If you sign up at one of the Maple levels, you will get to participate in monthly video votes, which helps determine the videos that I make. The link to my Patreon can be found in the description below. Many things could be said about the Shadow Lords, saying that they are willing to sacrifice themselves for the betterment of Gaia is not one of them, which is a real problem because this is generally expected of you as a guru. But if you can get someone else to make the sacrifice for you, then you don't have to make it yourself. And sacrifice does play an important role. It is a reoccurring theme when it comes to the Shadow Lords. This does not mean that a Shadow Lord will never sacrifice themselves for a cause. Unfortunately, if they have become more zealot, more firmly entrenched in their belief, they will sacrifice not only themselves, but they will sacrifice anyone around them if it achieves the end result that they are looking for to their cause. In keeping with this theme, Shadow Lords, they have extreme reverence for lightning storms. They view them as an expression of their totem. Shadow Lords also have a very different approach to gifts when it comes to basically the rest of the Guru. Shadow Lords view gifts as a birthright, something that they are entitled to. However, in order to achieve your gift, you still must Prove yourself worthy. The leaders of the Shadow Lords are known as Alphas, and this is again fitting with the wolf themes throughout the Guru Nation. Most Alphas, well, they lord their status over all of their minions, and they're quite controlling. Many Alphas will actually build trust by endearing their tribe, endearing those closest to them to the Alpha. They will do this through positive reinforcement, through bribery, manipulation, it's easier to control willing zealots than it is to control an unwilling slave. But if you're trying to get in the good graces of an alpha and you question their authority too much, you could find yourself at the end of a very sharp and pointy stick. Just a quick side note on the Shadow Lords since we're discussing them. In the East, there is a group of effectively Shadow Lords called the Haken. They are not the same tribe. Unlike their Western counterpart, the Haken have managed to balance their manipulation with the practice of Bushido. Bushido? Bushido. The Haken are one of the only groups, even though they are considered to be Guru, that have any relation with the beast courts in Asia. Let's go back to the early days, to the beginning times of the Shadow Lords. They originated in the steppes of Eurasia. It's here that the Shadow Lords learned to control the human tribes in the area. How did they do this? 
they worked themselves into the social tribes. There was werewolves among the people. And while they didn't necessarily go out and attain positions of power, they ingratiated themselves to the people and they were respected enough that even though they didn't hold authoritative power, appointed position power, they were still respected enough that if they said something, they were listened to. Now, during this time, the Shadow Lords, they were second in command of the Guru Nation. They were behind the Silver Fangs. In the early days of humanity, the earlier days of werewolves, they did support the Silver Fangs and they got along fairly well. This, unfortunately, was not to last. During these days, the Shadow Lords ingratiated themselves to the Silver Fangs to the point where they were still consulted with things and whatever they said had weight. They also were an asset to the Silver Fangs because the Shadow Lords were willing to do the dirty work, the wet work, the non-glorious work. The Shadow Lords did things, horrible things, terrible things at the behest of the Silver Fangs because the Silver Fangs didn't want to get their reputation dirty, stained, or muddied with the dishonor associated to these acts. Even though they were doing the work of the Silver Fangs, the Shadow Lords were still used as scapegoats when the Silver Fangs got caught doing something that they shouldn't. The Shadow Lords, they accepted this. They knew that this was the price to pay for being the second in command. And because they believed that they were actively working to the betterment of the Guru Nation. It wouldn't be until the Concord, which ended the Impergium, that the Shadow Lords would really start to feel their discontent with the Silver Fangs. The Shadow Lords felt that many of the issues which brought on the Impergium in the first place were not addressed properly with the Concord. If you need a quick refresher, the Impergium was the culling of humanity in the prehistoric times. It is the reason that we fear the dark. The Red Talons, they are still calling for an Impergium 2.0, and they have been ever since the Concord. During this time, the Shadow Lords would follow their herd, and they progressed through Eastern Europe. It's here that the Shadow Lords became locked in an intense battle, a giant war with a vampire brood, the werewolves, they call them leeches, the Zemisi. The Shadow Lords, they didn't have good relations with the local populations. So instead, the Shadow Lords, they ingratiated themselves to the barbarians, which would eventually go on to sack Rome. There were some ambassadors to the Silver Fangs in their ranks as well, and they found a suitable place among the Senate in Rome. The Shadow Lords also began to teach their people, teach their brethren the ways of the Romans. They did actually have some good combat prowess. Moving into the Dark Ages, the Shadow Lords found an extreme extreme distaste for a religion which was growing, at the time, Christianity. The institutionalism of the church alienated the people from their tribal roots, and this did not work very well for the Shadow Lords. The Shadow Lords, they now had a problem. They were used to manipulating people. They were not used to manipulating institutions. This was never something that they had come across before. As the church grew, their tactics became outdated. It's easy to manipulate a single person. It's not easy to manipulate an entire organization, at least not on your own. The Shadow Lords found themselves stretched thin. Not only were they battling the church, but they were also battling vampires who were springing up in the area. But learn they did and adjust their tactics, they did. You still have the problem of fighting vampires, which, you know, but they were able to adjust and they were able to adapt and the Dark Ages honestly were not a bad time to be a Shadow Lord. During this time, some of the Shadow Lords were very intrigued with Islam, another religion which Christians were fighting against. While the Shadow Lords themselves never actually adopted the Islamic religion, the Islamic faith, they did enjoy some of its inner workings, and so did the Mongols. With this, the Shadow Lords and the Mongols were mixed together, and this is how we get some of the original Haken. It wouldn't be until 1456 when the Shadow Lords had a new enemy, one that was very prolific and very difficult to deal with, the Impaler Prince Vlad Tepes otherwise known as Vlad the Impaler, or in the World of Darkness setting, Dracula. Originally, Vlad did work with the Shadow Lords in his campaign against the Turks. Later, however, he would consort with the Zemisi and the Shadow Lords. They didn't take very kindly to this. 
In the end, however, the Shadow Lords, they are responsible for the imprisonment, coming up with the plan for the imprisonment of Dracula, by the hands of Matthias Corvinus, the King of Hungary. Just a quick side note here on Vlad, Dracula, he was a very powerful Zemisi elder by the end of his days. He was extremely resourceful and unmatched in his cruelty. He would eventually gain his undead status, his undead life, at the hands of Lombach Ruthven. Vlad convinced Lombach to embrace him. The Shadow Lords would then go on to take credit for killing Dracula in 1475, but they lied. It wouldn't be until the start of the Renaissance era when the Shadow Lords' illusion of control over humanity would shatter. They would eventually realize that the Guru mission to control humanity had failed. The Renaissance was also known for something else, and that was the discovery of the New World. This would also be one of the darkest chapters in the Shadow Lord history. To say that a Shadow Lord experiences remorse is just well, nobody says that. But talking about this particular time in the Shadow Lord history, this is probably one of the few things that a Shadow Lord, any of the Shadow Lords, are genuinely remorseful for. This would be the extinction of the Camazons. In the tribe's original dealings with Vlad the Impaler, with Dracula, they were a bit on edge with shape-shifting man-bats, especially ones who practiced blood sacrifice. When the Shadow Lords discovered there was a species of pharah, a type of pharah that was using blood sacrifice, blood magic, blood rituals, and coming off of the back of their failure to properly manage Dracula, they made a bit of a hasty decision. The Shadow Lords went on a bit of a killing spree. They slaughtered the Camazots to the last. There were other groups of pharaoh within the Mesoamerican civilizations which were not spared the wrath of the Shadow Lords, the Balam, the Makole, to name a few. The name of the Shadow Lord who killed the last Camazot was Darklaw of Vengeance. Upon the death of the last Camazot, a scream resounded. It resonated through the entire tribe. It forced every tribe to their knees with racking grief. This happened to everyone, even if they had no idea why it was happening. The scream of the last Camazot. This also created a problem for the Guru and the Shadow Lords in the area because this sound, this scream, awakened a sleeping behemoth. A worm monstrosity known as Storm Eater arose. This creature, this minion of the worm, wreaked havoc across the American West. But the Shadow Lords would have a small consolation prize in the sense that the problem they had created would also be solved by a Shadow Lord. They were able to gather their forces to rally the tribes and defeat the Bane. In the Victorian age, the Shadow Lords had some more meddling and this gained them even more ire from the Silver Fangs. Back in Europe, the Silver Fangs messed with the balance of the Balkans, which the Silver Fangs were trying to maintain. There was some significant infighting between House Austere and House Crescent Moon. Part of the war they were fighting, they were trying to free a sept from control of vampire hands. This would be Sept of the Night Sky. This event, as the werewolves would succeed, gained the ire of the Zemisi and the vampires, they started a campaign against the werewolves. They wanted their vengeance. It wouldn't be until the Great War when the Shadow Lords would claim that the Silver Fangs had lost their influence, they had lost their power, and they had no more right to rule. This is when the Shadow Lord aspirations of being the Alpha of the Guru Nation really began to take hold. For the most part, Modern Knights is not a good time to be a Shadow Lord either. They had a very difficult time with the Second World War and controlling all the banes that came out of this upheaval. During the Cold War, it got a tiny bit easier for the Shadow Lords. They adopted the mass paranoia that was going around in society. Here is where they started working a little bit more as information brokers. They were actively trying to protect their kinfolk from the purges of Stalin. The Shadow Lords, they kind of liked Russia, they liked the secrecy that they were able to achieve in this area. When the Iron Curtain fell, the Shadow Lords were none too pleased. In the final night setting, this is kind of a grey area with the upcoming release, being that 
Probably none of this is going to have happened in W5. This was basically the apocalypse setting in the previous versions, W20 and revised going back to that. There is a story of redemption here. The Shadow Lords finding themselves in the Amazon War. They were trying to help, but they were very distrusted by the local natives for their hand in the destruction of the Camazots. A descendant of Dark Claw of Vengeance, Miguel Gutierrez, he ended up making some inroads with the local native population and began a very dangerous journey. Miguel, he went on a trip to the Malpheus. This is hell. Not only did he go to hell, but he went to the Black Spiral Labyrinth. And within the labyrinth, he was able to retake, to capture back a piece of the soul of Bat. He was able to free this portion of Bat's psyche from the worm's hold, from its grasp. This showed the local tribes that the Shadow Lords were willing to learn from their mistakes. This would also give them the trust they needed to participate in the Amazon War. In the final nights, Dracula, who the Shadow Lords said they had killed, also came back and posed a significant problem for the Guru Nation. Tell me what you think about the Shadow Lords in the comments below. Also, if you want to learn more about my personal favorite tribe within Werewolf the Apocalypse, you need to click this video here. Thank you to all of my patrons for supporting me and the channel. All of your ongoing support is greatly appreciated. My name's Nathaniel. Thanks for stopping by, everyone.